Okay. I think we should start. Uh, we're quite a large group, um, and we've got quite a range of potential issues to, um, to cover. I, I don't propose to, to say anything further. I mean, I've introduced the topics, and I think, though, we, we should try and be perhaps a bit systematic with our discussion. We've got 45 minutes, and perhaps if we could take certain themes and look at those rather than try and just go here, there, and everywhere, but I, I'm in your hands for that. So I, I think it would be good if whoever wants to speak first starts and we can move forward with those points. And I, I think we have interpretation, so if we need it, that's fine too. So who wants to kick off? You okay? Fine. Okay, that's fine. That's good for me. <laughs> uh, I ask before that question, yes, we, uh, uh, before, uh, we can run. Uh, we have a uh, court case in January, and uh, as, uh, not as evidence, but as argument, we used uh, one case from Estonia, Leavi. Lea, Lea case, yes. But... Uh, in front of that, uh, our court argues that it, it's absolutely another situation, and 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 uh, it's it, it is about special uh, investigation activities. It's not about operative uh, legislation activities. And by them, uh, uh, I am a little bit. Uh, Confused. Confused, yes. <laughs> Confused about our our court attention uh, attention to European uh, human rights court uh, decisions. That's the main problem. Of course, the European court can decide what they decided, but our courts are ruling as they are ruling all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Please. Just to continue mm. on what Mr. Vapinch has just stated, we have an interesting system mm. in Latvia which consists of uh, uh, secret surveillance measures under the law on operative, so-called operative investigative activity, mm. which means that uh, a person can be under secret surveillance, to put it roughly, for uh, before or without any initiation of any criminal proceedings. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a person is actually denied any guarantees inherent for uh, criminal proceedings as a defendant, and he can be under secret surveillance of ov for overall time of even up to 15 years. Surveillance, do you mean eavesdropping? Uh, wire, eavesdropping, wiretapping, uh, any other type of measures that you can think of. And is this judicially authorized? Yes, okay. it is judicially authorized. Uh, this is also kind of a problem because it's authorized by, uh, as far as we know, uh, two particular judges of the Supreme Court. And, uh, of course under a certain time when these judges just all they do is authorize and authorize and authorize because the secret surveillance techniques are used awfully widely in Latvia, then of course uh, since these judges are not under obligation to even look into the basis for such secret surveillance, it becomes rather automatic when they are asked they authorize. Yeah. A person doesn't have the right to know even if uh, in the past he or she has been under secret uh, surveillance. And uh, the length can be, as I said, up to 15 years, the overall length of such secret mm -hmm. surveillance. So this situation is created by one specific law, mm -hmm. uh, which is as old as 1993. For, for Latvia, it's a rather old mm -hmm. law, I would mm -hmm. say, because most of them has been changed and amended with the lapse of time. So in this, I must say that uh, I'm also a defense lawyer in criminal proceedings, and uh, we all are very thankful to the case of Baltic versus Latvia, because it's actually the first time when exactly against Latvia 
Latvia the decision like that has been taken. And as far as we understand, the situation is rather unique for uh, Europe. This measure is taken without criminal proceedings or outside mm -hmm. criminal proceedings. So Baltic finally may be, hopefully will uh, make our courts to look at the situation mm -hmm. a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there are a number of issues here, and I think obviously which we may have explored in further litigation. I mean, judicial, in the Strasbourg system, judicial supervision is meant to be the guarantee. Uh, but of course, if judicial supervision is just a rubber stamp, uh, then it's not judicial supervision. So that is one area I think where there's a need for exploration. The length of it, and of course its impact, does, the impact stretched people other than the person who's being surveyed. So it's, in fact, lots of people's telephone conversations end up being third yeah, third parties. So you have that, that question there. And the length of period is clearly problematic um, because effectively, if you are talking, I mean, even several years uh, without some proceedings, then it doesn't seem to be even within the criminal process at all. I mean, because you can understand perhaps if you have suspicion, but nothing else. But the point at the back there. Well, then, at least as Gandalf is, was my trust it. Precisely, I wish that this were here. No, no, sure. Protams, sab kolēģi, ļoti pareiz arī pats ir šo tie autojumu saistībā ar šīm te policijas iestāžu veiktajām slapnējām darbībām. Un, protams, loģiski, kad tādas darbības kā novērošanas, saruna noklausīšanās, kontroles, korespondences un, un, un iepas saraksta kontroles, un iepšaubām viņas būs un paliks, bet, protams, ir vairāk tādas nianses Latvijā, ko arī faktiski šī te baltiņa lieta varētu parādīt. Nu, pirmkārt, tā cilvēka tiesības pret kuru šīs darbības ir veiktas. Un, ja šīs šo darbību rezultāti, teiksim, telefonu sarunu noklausīšanās rezultāti, korespondences kontroles rezultāti nonāk tiesā, tiek mēģināti izmantot kā pierādījumi, nu, šobrīd, diemžēl, Latvijā šī te sistēma ir ļoti, ļoti nepilnīga, Un regulējums, kā šādus pierādījums izmanto, ir, nu, teiksim, tā ļoti vispārīgs un nekonkrēts. Un patiešām, kā te pareizi kolēģis norādīja, jā, tā tad faktiski cilvēks nevar ne precīzi noskaidrot, cik ilgi pret viņu veiktas šādas darbības, un nevienmēr arī ir pilnībā pieejami šo te darbību rezultāti. Un arī attiecībā uz operatīvojumu, teiksim, eksperimentiem, Nu, ir pietiekami liels riskas, ka netiek sniegta no valsts iestādes pilnīga informācija par to, kā tas ir noticis vispār. Nu, teiksim, kaut vai tās pašas narkotika iegādes gadījumā, mēs nekad nevaram zināt, vai mums procesa virzītājs, vai mums policijas darbinieki iedot pilnvērtīgu informāciju par to, kurā brīdī tad vispār ir sācies kontakts ar šo te cilvēku, kurā brīdī ir, teiksim, noticis kaut kāds, varbūt pat piedāvājums no policijas darbinieka puses, ka veikt kaut kādas pretiesiskas darbības, un bieži vien mēs saņemam tikai pašu, pašu beigu rezultātu, pašu, pašu, nu, brīdi, kad viņš, teiksim, jau ir izdarījis paņēmis naudiņu, atdevis tās narkotikas vēl kaut ko, jā, bet visu šo te priekšvēsturi mēs neredzam, un principā šeit policijai šobrīd ir ļoti plašas iespējas šo te priekšvēsturi noklusēt. Un tas pats attiecas attiecībā uz korespondences kontroli, tas pats attiecās uz telefonu sarunu kontroli. Ir pietiekami bieži, kad mēs redzam īpaši lietās, kas nāk vēl no, teiksim tā, ar vēsturas, ar vēsturu, ar 5-6 gadu atpakaļ, kad, kad, kad nebija, teiksim, arī šī iespēja kriminālu procesā veikt sevišķā veidā veicamās darbības. Mēs redzam to, ka šīs te sniegtā informācija par operatīvo pasākumu norisi ir fragmentāra. Tad policija nav devusi pilnīgi visu, kas ir viņas rīcībā, bet faktiski izlasīja uz to materiālu selektīvu. Un nav praktiska aizstāvībai arī pašam cilvēkam iespēja vairs pierādīt, ka redziet, nebija, ka tā aina nav pilnīga un ka tā informācija nav pilnīga. 
Un šeit gan attiecībā uz operatīvo darbību, gan attiecībā uz, uz, uz speciālajām izmeklēšanas darbībām Latvijā tas regulējums, diemžēl, ļoti, ļoti nepilnīgs. Es varbūt arī gribētu papildināt kolēģi, ka mums Latvija ir divi, divi institūti, viens ir operatīvie pasākumi un otrs speciālas izmeklēšanas darbības. Un speciālas izmeklēšanas darbības tiek veiktas pamatojoties uz rajonu tiesnešu lēmumu, nevis atsākas ties lēmumu. Un arī par speciālu izmeklēšanas darbību veikšanu faktiski persona uzzināt tikai pēc procesa pabeigšanas iepazīties. Un šie materiāli arī tiek pievienot tikai daļai. Tas ir faktiski tās pats, tādas pats sekas, tāda pati faktiska situācija tikai ar citu nosaukumu un ar citu tiesatļaušanas, tiesatļaujas līmeni. Okay. Now, the problem with disclosure is, is, is a big, really, one which really does have serious effects on fairness. It reminds me of a story from long, long ago before technology develops where um, a man who was working for the British government was discovered his file, which had been kept on him after the war, and he'd been surveyed. And the entry was that he had gone into this hotel with this woman. That was the information. And, of course, we would draw conclusions. But the thing is, they were only following him and the woman. They weren't interested in who else. They only recorded that fact. In fact, there were at least ten other people with them, uh, which, of course, changes the whole way you interpret that events. So the problem of disclosure in different ways is, is very important. You end up with serious problems. That you may find that so far the court in Strasbourg really hasn't quite had to grapple with this. It has had some problems about problems of non-disclosure of evidence from, for security considerations. Um, but more of the cases are beginning to bubble, mainly coming from the United Kingdom because of problems with dealing with terrorists. And you've de they've developed there the use of special counsel because one of the problems the security service are concerned about is if you disclose information to uh, the lawyer even for a potential terrorist, then that may be detrimental to national security. So for certain aspects of the proceedings, they're represented by lawyers who have security clearance. But the English courts have now come to the conclusion that that may not be compatible with a fair trial either, where you have a situation where the evidence um, doesn't allow the person to make defence. Because if you only allow the special counsel to have access to certain evidence and you cannot rebut certain points because you haven't seen it, then the proceedings are not regarded as fair. So it, in the sense there you have perhaps the, the English Supreme Court going slightly ahead of the way the court in Strasbourg may go. It may yet come there, I don't know. Um, but you also have the problem that if you have evidence which you gather uh, which is not disclosed, then that's part of the duty of disclosure as a general one. Um, that may be subject to some judicial supervision, but if your surveillance has got evidence, for example, you come back to your drug example, it may well be that there is exculpatory evidence, but which the police for some reason don't choose to use. And I'm not saying it's their malicious, because sometimes they, people just focus on certain things and will see this as being the key thing. They don't realize the context. So I think you have a number of problem areas here which are certainly worth exploring further um, in litigation before the court. Anything else on, on surveillance, please? Oh, okay. No, that we can change. I mean, that's, I just wanted to check. Uh, um, I have a particular field I was uh, regarding police activities mm. and regarding the fairness of evidence. And um, uh, today, previously, there has been mentioned that there are no proper medical records, there are no proper uh, record of uh, injuries suffered during detention and so on. Uh, and uh, I, I have been dealing with uh, medical issues in, uh, in different cases, criminal, civil cases, mm -hmm. and administrative cases. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to uh, ask you to explore a little bit. If you look at the bodily injuries, if you look at the in, in, in that, 
this is, this is the, the, in respect to evidence when the third party is invited. And then uh, another issue is in the, but related to the same. Um, until now, there is kind of over trust to forensic expert that he will do his job properly. Mm -hmm. But as we know, uh, there, there are possibilities to corrupt those people. There are uh, uh, time to time they don't pro uh, produce quality results. And I was already con discussing the issue with his colleagues. Should there be, uh, in, in such case, already the representative, uh, the defendant's lawyer, in, the defendant's advocate, invited already to the scene to participate in investigative matters uh, related to medical uh, investigations. And already that, that uh, wherever there is, there is a profession ex expert making a collection of evidence, and the def uh, and, and representative of the uh, defense uh, attorney is already uh, participating in the process. Okay. There are a lot of difficult issues, um, but very important ones. So you, clearly, I mean, if you look, for example, the prison rules that the Council of Europe have, I mean, when people are in detention, there are obligations about medical conditions, and that should happen at a very early stage. Um, even when a person is taken in, you should make sure they're in, in good shape. Um, but there are clear duties also on making sure that people, if, if you're just in the police station, that actually if there is a sign of injury, then that should be the responsibility of the person in charge of the police station to ensure they have treatment. And this came up in, in the, the Jasinski's case. The, the, there's a clear failure to, to, to act in those circumstances. Um, so the standards are not not absent. It's a question of implementation. But that, that, so that's the, the first point. The second point you were raising is about the question of experts. And that clearly is a potential problem. I mean, it's not just a problem in the criminal side. It's a problem in civil proceedings. You get experts who end up being case hardened, uh, in a sense, because they're always doing work for the police. Uh, they, we're not necessarily saying they're corrupt, but they, their perspective tends to be affected. Uh, some people may be corrupt, but I do want to emphasize that it can be just simply you, you end up because you, you repeatedly do the same thing, you make the same assumptions. Um, the, in, in some legal systems, it's normal to have experts on both sides in proceedings, I mean, but that's not usually the case. Um, but it is clear that you should be able to have experts if there are doubts of the kind that you've been raising. So I think it's important that the legal system be prepared to admit that possibility. But that doesn't deal with the problem that you're really talking about, which is how do you actually record the issue in a definitive way. And certainly I can recall some cases, but it's on the civil side, because I'm not sure the issue has come up um, in criminal cases, but in some cases, for example, of medical negligence, uh, it's been very clear that if you, the judge is not the medical expert, and so the judge, in a way, delegates some of the work to a medical expert to investigate what happened, to discuss and interrogate people. But the court has also found that in that kind of situation, if the other party is not present, then it may actually be quite impossible at the, the court stage to gainsay what the, the expert has said because the judge is not really equipped to do that. And so the conclusion the court in Strasbourg reached is that where you're having this kind of expertise, it's appropriate for the person, to, the defense or whatever the party is, to be present at the workings of the medical expert because in a sense... Although the expert is a witness, in, in another sense, he or she is doing something conclusive in the, in, the, in the proceedings. Because if the person comes to the court and says, and it's difficult to argue against it, the uh, state of the evidence was this, and it, it's dependent upon the, 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 the scene of the crime, and it's too late afterwards to look at it, then that's deciding the matter. 
So you need to be able to say, well, actually, why aren't you looking at this, or what about that? Um, and in, if I remember rightly, in the new Ukrainian Criminal Procedure Code, there is specific provision for the participation of defense lawyers in investigative actions. Um, that, I don't think that's a, a, an explicit um, European standard, but I think it shows the direction in which um, the European standards work. Because you're absolutely right, of course, if the expert says this and, and there's no check, then it, it's too late. Yeah. Good day. Vilm Tvitoliņš, Iešlēp ministrija. Diemžēl man ir jāsaka, ka Latvijas Republika laikam nav unikāla valsts, un arī citās valstīs, lai vai mēs to sauktu par operatīvo darbību vai varbūt angliski labāk zināmo surveillance aktivitīs, bet tomēr valsti ir attiecīgiem dienestiem atļautas slapenas darbības un izskatās, ka cilvēktiesība tiesa šīs darbības ir tā tad vai šo valstu tiesības veiktas slapenas darbības ir akceptējusi. Nu, droši vien viens no slavenākajiem cilvēktiesību tiesas priedumiem šajā lietā ir šādās gadījumos ir klāsi nādās pret Vāciju. Bet varbūt tās kolēģiem labāk ir zināma lieta Kennedy pret apvienoto karalisti. Un attiecīgi šajās tebās lietās izskatās, ka cilvēktiesība tiesa par šiem aspektiem ir spriedusi tā dēvējot in abstrakto, jo faktiski konkrēta cietušā tur nebija, bet bija pieņēmums, ka pret konkrēto cilvēku varētu būt, ka valsts ir veikusi šādas slapenās darbības. Šādās lietās attiecīgi tiesa ir nospriedusi, ka viss šis slapenais process tiek skatīts kopumā un tiek izvērtēti visas cilvēku tiesību garantijas, jeb tā dāvētie safeguards, un konstatēts, vai tas process ir korekts vai ne. Tomēr šajās abās lietās tātad tiesa apstājās ar to, ka personā ir tiesības uz kompensāciju gadījumā, ja tie konstatēts, ka valsts rīkojusies nekorekti, bet šajās lietās nav pateikts līdz galam, kā tad īsti šī kompensāciju ir iespējams nodrošināt, jo no vienas puses valsts ir cilvēku tiesību tiesa ir atzinusi, ka šīs slepenās darbības drīkst var tikt veikas, un viņas tātad valsts veic, un attiecīgi atklāt šo darbību veikšanu nebūtu pieļaujums, jo pretējā gadījumā šis process nebūtu vairs efektīvs. Savukārt no otras puses mums ir tiesības uz kompensāciju, kur izskatās, ka varētu būt arī tā, ka neatklājot patiesībā cilvēku šo kompensāciju nevar saņemt, kas arī viņam ir garantēta no cilvēku tiesību konvencijas. Vai jūs varbūt varētu pakomentēt šo situāciju, padalīties varbūt ar savām pārdomām, kā tad īsti valstī vajadzētu rīkoties, jeb kurš princips būtu augstāk vērtējams valsts pozitīvais tātad pienākums atklāt noziedzīgus nodarījumus vai, es drīzāk teiktu, smagus noziedzīgus nodarījumus, terorismu un cilvēka, tātad atkal cilvēka tiesībās garantētais tiesības saņemt kompensāciju. Paldies! Paldies! I should say, with all respect to Judge Seema, that the court doesn't always provide all the answers. I mean, that's, that's true of all the judges. I mean, and of course, you're right that this is the difficulty that, that, that states are always in. You have to work out what judge, judgments are about. And you also, I think, there needs to be careful. For example, the class case was quite an early judgment. But you also had a situation where you could see that the German system of control was extremely thorough. Um, and some of the examples that we've been talking about here uh, might not meet the requirements that the court would expect. I, but I think the court rightly, and it, it, it's inconceivable that we're going to cease to have surveillance work. Uh, that I think the court is not suggesting. And the, 
the question is how the surveillance takes place. And I think the issue of disclosure, you're again right. I mean, again, a favorite story of mine uh, was from Tajikistan when some people were being listened to. They were Italian speaking, and the voice came on the line and said, please speak in English, um, so that the, because the people listening in could not understand Italian. Um, and they knew, that these were diplomats, they knew they could speak uh, English. Um, but you can't tell the people you're watching because precisely that destroys the whole point. I mean, it, these people then would start talking about coffee and not talk about um, whatever they were talking about. So I, I think it's unrealistic to say that you must tell people that they've been subject to surveillance. Um, it may be the issue of compensation could arise if you had impropriety which has been demonstrated. Then I think... Uh, because it could come out sometimes, because the case that followed class uh, was the, the UK case of Malone, where the surveillance had been going on without a legal base for many, many years, and it only came into the public domain because of a stupid policeman who mentioned in court uh, that they had heard the, the person saying this when they were listening to the telephone conversation. The policeman had not been properly trained and revealed something which... Uh, had been secret for 20 years or more. Um, and so then the UK had to change its, its legislative framework. But the point, you, you can't realistically say that people should have to be told, but if things come into the public domain, and in particular it's shown that it's improper, then the issue of compensation might arise. Um, but I think you can't say that if surveillance has been properly authorised and conducted in a proper fashion that there is a right to compensation. I, I don't think the court would expect that. Um, it's only where you've got impropriety. And clearly, you will have situations where, I mentioned the case of some, the position in Russia, where there was no regulatory framework at all. Uh, effectively, there was an order, but you, it didn't really set out any conditions. You could do what you want. You could do it for as long as you want. Who was affected? And that kind of framework would be one which was inconsistent with the convention. Um, so the, the crucial thing is to have proper control, and that means more detail, I think, in the, in the legislation. It means judicial supervision, and it means, I think, review periodically of authorization, because simply because you said you can do it, but... This idea of 15 years passing, I'm not saying that's necessarily true in all cases, there's something clearly wrong there because if you haven't actually prosecuted someone within that kind of period, then why are you listening? What's the point? What are you doing with this data? I, I'm not saying it's impossible there isn't a justification in, in some case, but I find it hard to imagine that there is. So you need these kind of controls. And the other point I would make is that you've got to be careful, that, again, it goes back to the terrorist example I've given, because if you have this data, then there is a risk also that what you hear can be exculpatory. And if you don't reveal that in some way, then you may actually lead to injustice. And, but at the same time, you don't want to reveal it. But then the answer the court gives is that if you can't put something into play, then the conclusion is you don't prosecute. Um, you have to find some other way of dealing with the problem. But a fair trial is the dominant consideration as well. But it's, all not, it's not all completely neat. I accept that. Okay. Okay. Jautājums ir varbūt mums es Par šo kontrolu vairāk vai mazāk ir šis jautājums jau sakārtojies, ja, nu, kārtojās. Bet lielāk problēma ir ar pieejušiem materiāliem, kuri ir savākti tad, kad persona jau ir iesaistīta procesā. Jo mēs nonākam diezgan absurdā situācijā, kad persona, pret kuri celta apsūdzība, attiecībā pret kuri tiek izmantot kaut kādu pierādījumu, piemēram, telefonu sarunu ieraksti, kad viņš paprast šos telefonu sarakstus, pilnus ierakstus, Ja par ilgāku periodu viņam pasaka, tas tagad ir valsts noslēpums. Un tā ir mazliet absurda situācija, kad 
Ko cilvēks kādreiz pats ir runājis, tas kaut kādā brīdī kļūs par valsts noslēpumu. Viņš pats vairāk nevar noklausīties un varbūt izmantot kaut ko no tā vica, lai varētu sev aizstāvēt. Un līdz ar to būtu ļoti svarīgi jūsu komentārs par šīm, par pieeju, ja kaut ko mēs angliski apzīmējam equality of arms, ja, tā tad aizstāvēšanās procesā, tā tad cik tālu mēs varētu tomēr prasīt, lai mums dod šo pieeju šiem materiāliem. Nerunājot pa izmeklēšanas metodēm, ir noklausīšanās metodēm, tehniku, personām, bet tieši par savākto materiālu. Jo, piemēram, Vācijā, cik man ir zināms, tur iedod visu to materiālu, kas ir savākti sākot ar to, cikos sākt sekošana, cikos beigta, ko ir runājis, kur ir runājis, ar ko ticies un tā tālāk. Varbūt varat komentēt mazliet viņu par šo pieeju šiem materiāliem. I don't think most countries are as generous as the Germans. I mean, that's not um, to say that the Germans are wrong, uh, but um, they are quite scrupulous. I mean, they, they, the privacy is a very strong right in, in, in the German system, I think probably stronger than under the convention. Um, but there is, I mean, this issue has come up not from the privacy point of view, but about the evidential point of view. Um, it may be inconsistent with the interests of national security to hand over the, the transcripts, dis, despite the, the German approach. But if the evidence it does exist and you are not disclosing it to the court, let alone the, the, the party, then you run the risk that this will be a, a, an unfair trial. Because if you are taking what someone says and you take it out of context, then the court can draw conclusions which are mistaken. Um, and that's why I was mentioning earlier about the situation where with the approach the UK has got of the, the special counsel, you, where you have sometimes evidence which you don't want to reveal, perhaps because, I mean, one of the things is if you say this person was seen doing something, and that means revealing the person who saw who could then be at risk, that sometimes there will be reasons why you don't want to disclose that. But for that to be acceptable, and it hasn't, this hasn't been tested in, in Strasbourg yet, but within the UK system, to be acceptable, it, you have to disclose to the court, and the court has to be the person that decides whether or not it can be used and whether or not any disclosure is needed in those circumstances so that you don't have a situation where it's solely the executive deciding to maintain that secrecy. And if you're having a situation where you have evidence obtained and you're only disclosing a certain part which doesn't allow you to produce evidence to support your point that actually this is out of context, then inevitably that is an unfair proceeding. Uh, and so I think it, it's, it's, it isn't just about surveillance, it's about also what happens in, in the court process. Um, and different countries may have different solutions as to how they uh, deal with it, but in the end you've got to ensure the process is a fair one. Uh, this is the reason why in the UK, because they have not prosecuted a lot of people suspected of terrorism because they do not want to reveal the data. Now, that may be mistaken, but their view is they want to keep secret the means of surveillance because they think it more important for being able to anticipate terrorist activities. But that means that they know they cannot prosecute these people. Um, but that is consistent with the Convention. Mazliet gribētu papildināt arī to, ko iekšķiet ministrijas pārstāvis teica, teiksim, tas līdz šim būtiskākais tas problēma jautājums ir bijis par to, kad, kad šī te operatīvā darbība, kas ir zinātniski pamatota un atzīta par, par, par normālu sistēmu, slēptu veicam pasākumu sistēmu un... un, un kas arī būtu jāturpina veikt, un es domāju, tur nav argumenti, kāpēc to aizliegt, varbūt tiek veikta par ilgu, 
Un sabiedrībai tik nesaprotamā veidā vai arī ar šiem te kāzusiem tiesās, kad noteikti apsvērumu dēļ aizstāvības pusē apsūdzētie nevar iepazīties ar, ar visiem materiāliem, arī radījusi tādu, tādu diskusiju, kas īstenībā ir ļoti vajadzīgi. Manā uzskatā pietrūks tieši šī te operatīvās darbības procesa vai uzraudzības vai kontroles sistēmas pilnveidojumu. Proti ar to es domāju, ka vajadzētu tomēr plašāk izmantot prokuratūras institūtu, nemēs tik daudz akmeni, kā saka, augstākās tiesas dārziņā, kar, kur nu, kolēģi varbūt nav pilnīgi informēti, jā, bet te runāju par diviem tiesnešiem, kas kaut ko skatās un, un, un nezinu, ko skatās, tas tā nav, jā, bet nemēs tā akmeni viņu dārziņā, bet tieši izmantot šo te prokuratūras institūtu, proti krimināla procesa likums paredz normālu uzraudzības kārtību, ko veids prokuratūra. Tieši tādā pašā veidā pastiprināt, kontrolējot operatīvo darbību prokuroram ne tikai formāli saņemot paziņojumu, kad ir uzsākts operatīvās darbības proceses, kā to paredz likums, ka prokurors tiek informēts, bet esot aktīvi iesaistītam, būda, esot informētam par visiem svarīgākajiem lēmumiem, kas tiek pieņemti šajā te operatīvajā darbībā, novērsīsies tā problemātika, kad tiks vai noklausīt, vai izsakot, vai kā citādā veidā tiks slēpeni iedarbot darbosies institūcijas uz, uz, uz cilvēkiem. Tajā pat laikā varbūt jau ir iespēja to visu jau veikt procesuālu un pāriet uz procesuālām darbībām un, un, un uz speciālām izmeklēšanas darbībām un to visu jau veikt procesu ietvaros kas momentāli kļūst jau par fiksētu pierādījumu un uh, var vispār izvairīties no tā, ka šie te operatīvie materiāli jebkad parādīsies, jo procesu materiāli viss būs pieejami un, un, un nevienam pret to nebūs nekāda iebilduma. Uh, tas ir viens. Un otrs uh, par šo te problemātiku mazliet, uh, ko arī ieskicēja, kad uh, no operatīvās darbības netiek izsniegti pilnībā visi ieraksti un tam līdzīgi tur uh, apsvēruma mēdz būs dažādi, uh, nu, visos gadījumos tur droši vien ar nacionālās drošības interesēm diez vai var argumentēt, bet uh, savu apsvērumu, kāpēc to neizsniedz, varbūt ir, lai pasargātu arī kaut kāds cilvēks, kas figurē šajā te procesā, tā skaitā varbūt arī informātoru loks ir bijis starp, starp uh, šiem te noklausāmās personas kontaktiem, un, uh, nu, kā mēs zinām, tad mums ir Tāda interesanta praksa, visus tos procesu materiālus nerētu aiznest pie žurnālistiem un, un, un tās sarunas sāk publicēt, un tad ir visādi komentāri un viss pārējais. Un ja viņam no labu prāt neviens neteiks, tad komentāros ļoti labi var norādīt, kad reikot, tas pat tev būs informācija, nodevs vēl kaut ko, nu, tur ir savu apsvērumu. <coughs> un trešais, ko es gribēju vaicāt, kāds ir jūsu skatījums uh, uz to, kad uh, tiek piemēroti šī te pasākumi, teiksim, kas ir nopietni cilvēku tiesības ierobežojoši pasākumi, saistībā pret personām turot viņas aizdomās par kaut kādiem smagiem noziegumiem un tiek saņemt informāciju, kas būtībā ir par kaut kādiem nelieliem pārkāpumiem, var, varbūt tur krimināli pārkāpums vai mazāk smagi noziegumi un, vai vie, nu, viegli nodarījumi un kā viņi būtu tiesiski izmantojam vai neizmantojam attiecīgā situācijā, un, un, un vai tas pasākums uh, ir samērīgs, ka, teiksim, šāds te cilvēki tiesību ierobežojuši pasākums tiek veikts, nu, 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 un beig, beigās, nu, tur gandrīz par, par, par administratīvo pārkāpumu varētu saukt to cilvēku pie atbildības, vai kā? Paldies! Well, in, last, in relation to your last point, I think this comes back to the, the monitoring of your, your surveillance because if it's clear that nothing useful is actually uh, coming out of it, then that may well be reasons for saying this should stop, um, that this isn't actually we're going up the wrong tree I mean, because you may be wasting resources um, because surveillance is not cheap either. Uh, you have to spend resources in, in doing it. So 
it is good practice to be constantly monitoring whether it is worth continuing with the activity. And if, if it isn't, then you have to go back and think through why you started this, was there some reason, or perhaps you're looking in the wrong place. The surveillance may be wrongly directed, or it may be just completely wrong. So I think you've got to continually keep this under review. Otherwise, you're not uh, ensuring that it's um, within the limits which are acceptable. Um, I'm all in favor of what you suggest about the prosecutor monitoring, but I wouldn't say that that should be something on top of, it shouldn't be in place of judicial safeguards. Um, the prosecutor is not an independent party. It, it, the, the prosecutor is part of the, the process. So self-regulation, whether it be by the police or by the prosecution, is important. I mean, I, I, no question that the high standards that we, we should expect of people in the legal profession and in law enforcement are such that they should be monitoring what they do and it's the prosecutor should be checking because, as I was saying earlier, it may well be a waste of money, public money, in terms of surveillance. Some people, some police officers, it may be quite a nice time doing surveillance activities. Um, but in the end, the responsibility which is clear under the case law of the court is the safeguard is judicial control and judicial control must be effective judicial control and therefore if the, it's just two judges who become rather too easy to, to give approval I'm not saying that's the case but if that were the case it would be totally wrong uh, the, the judge should be prepared to question whether or not this is, is necessary and the person coming and saying, I need this um, authorization, needs to be put to the test. I'm not saying you should refuse, but if the judge doesn't really question in a strict way, in a skeptical way, because if you believe everything a policeman tells you, then you're not doing your job properly. Uh, you've got to actually put them under some pressure. And so the judge has a big responsibility. And I, I, don't, I don't think personally that it is a good idea it's the same judge repeatedly. I mean, it may be for a, period, a short period of time because you need to be equipped to understand the technicalities. But we shouldn't be talking about the same judge for a period of years because then it's inevitable that you become probably case hard. Just maybe to give a short uh, example of uh, the situation I am aware of, uh, because I bring this complaint before the European Court of Human Rights, it has been communicated. It's a case of my colleague, a sworn attorney, which by occasion, as you just mentioned, by a stupidity of the police officer, learned that he was wiretapped uh, during a conversation with his client in a detention facility. And this uh, material has been put as evidence into the case file of his client. Uh, of course, then the prosecutor, by reviewing this um, uh, complaint, has admitted that it was wrongfully put into the case file. The basis for the wiretapping of a lawyer was the alleged breach of uh, legal ethics which is definitely, and I think quite clearly, unproportionate, but certainly the conversations of a lawyer is something very interesting for the police or for any special services, which are a lot in Latvia, mm. to be honest, who have uh, powers of secret surveillance. So uh, obviously none of us, also defense lawyers in this country, can be quite safe that uh, their conversations are not wiretapped. And there is one very important peculiarity of Latvian uh, system of operative measures. Uh, it can be started on suspicion of any crime. Not the criminal proceedings can, uh, sh are uh, instigated in order to prosecute for a particular crime. But if the authorities claim that they suspect a crime, they are not under obligation to start criminal proceedings, but they can start secret surveillance outside of criminal mm. proceedings. 
And this is uh, not only in cases of terrorism or any threat to national security. That can be any criminal, alleged criminal activity. But we don't time, so why procurator, but sick? Tā ir iestāde, kas uztur apsūdzību. Vispār varētu būt kontrolējošā, šīs likumības kontrolējošā iestāde, kas uzrauk vai visi tiek darīts pareizi. Jo viņi jau tomēr ir ieinteresēti sasniegt savu rezultātu. No. Uh, that was the point I was making. I, I don't mind the prosecutor taking the extra step of supervising, but that's something extra. It's not a, an alternative for effective... Yeah, I mean, it's perfectly good for institutions to, to regulate themselves. You should encourage it. But you, I will not be assured. I mean, this go, that way, otherwise you go back to the old system of the procuratura being the guardian, which is unacceptable under the convention system. Yeah, please. Yeah. Es gribētu kolēziem mazliet atgādināt tādu lietu, ka operatīvā darbība nav pilnīgi identiska kriminālu procesāliem mērķiem. Mērķi ir atšķirīgi likumā. Ja kriminālu procesu mums ir vērst uz to, ka mums vajadzētu precīzi konstatēt, kas ir noticis, un savāk tās ziņas nodot galu rezultātā vērtēšanai tiesā, tad uh, operatīvās darbības mērķis ir apdraudējuma novēršana. Un uh, apdraudējuma novēršana var, protams, uh, notikt, uh, sasniedzot kriminālu procesolos mērķis, bet var notikt arī citādi. Ja. Piemēram, ja runa ir par uh, Baltiņa lietu pret Latviju, ja mēs analoģiski iedomāsimies, ka būtu situācija, ka diplomātiskā piesagā esošā persona vēlētos uh, iegūt uh, slēpēnu raksturu ziņas no kādas Latvijas amatpersonas, un mēs izspēlēt šo situāciju šeit, tad kriminālu procesālās perspektīvas nav nekādas. Tad uh, maksimums varētu panākt uh, šādas personas izraidīšanu. Uh, taču tas nenozīmē to, ka šādas operatīvās, uh, operatīvās eksperimentas nebūtu jāveids. Un, uh, teiksim, piesaista pie kriminālu procesālā rakstura jautājumiem šeit rodas uh, gažam vienkārši tāpēc, ka tā ir redzamākā daļa, par pārējo runās tiek diezgan maz un daudz to arī neredz. Un otrs iemesos ir tas, ka, tas, ka no desmit operatīvās darbības subjektiem tieši astoņi uh, savā lielākā vairumā lieto operatīvās darbības tieši kriminālu procesālo mērķu nodrošināšanai un sasniegšanai. Un tāpēc parādās šīs asaisti un uh, visas no tā izrietošās problēmas. Bet vajadzētu saprast to, ka tā ir funkcija plašāka, kas ir vērsta uz valsts darbības nodrošināšanu kopumā. Un... Uh, Tātad kriminālu procesālais virzienas tas vienkārši viens no virzieniem, ko šajā operatīvā darbībā apkalpo. Paldies. Vēl viens ļoti īsts jautājums. Visam var piekrist, bet jautājums tad tādā gadījumā, cik ilgi operatīvā darbība drīkst ilgt, ilgt tātad, cik noziegums ir tātad, jeb kā lai pasaka precīzāk, kādreiz noteikti viens nozīgums, var redzēt operatīvā darbība turpinās, notiek otrs noziegums personu izdara. Kā citas apjomas faktiski, līdz kuram drīkst pieļaut, lai šī operatīvā darbība yeah. turpinās? Yeah. I, uh, I entirely agree that surveillance can be not connected with crime. I mean, I, I would disagree in, not in principle, but the, the emphasis is a question of emphasis. Of course you've got to deal with espionage um, and that's, that's every state has to do with that. But Your, your question just now is, is the crucial one. It's about, and it's a point I made earlier on, is how long this goes on. Um, and clearly surveillance is recognized as an intrusion in private life. That's the starting point. So therefore you have to justify it. That means not once, but continuing. Um, now, it may be there will be cases where you have to have long surveillance. It, that, that, that depends upon the particular problem that you're confronted with. But in general, we should be talking about relatively short periods because it's a serious interference with the private life, not only of the person being surveyed, but perhaps others as well. Because remember, 
when you're saying you can survey the person, he, may work, he or she may well be having intimate conversations which have got nothing to do with the matter under question, but which other people, because they're listening, are sharing. Um, so you have to review, and that's why I say that um, you need periodic renewal of the approval, because if you've had the approval given, it shouldn't just be indefinite. It should be what's coming out of this. Now, that's, that's two sides why I say that you need the operational services themselves to say, is this worth doing? Because, I mean, if you've been listening to this guy for six months and you've heard nothing which allows you to take action, why are you doing it? I mean, now, it may be the answer you come back is there is someone that comes along. But from the, 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 protect, from the court's point of view, they should be saying this is too long. But the problem with the other side of the thing, because yeah. they are waiting for a big fish, yes? they, he's committing a small crime, yes? but they are waiting for something... I understand. Say, oh, that's a problem. Yeah, no, but, but if they're waiting and, and there is a basis that something is coming, but the question is how long you wait, because if the, the review, what you should do is say, okay, six months he hasn't come, but we are confident that within the next three months the thing is going to happen and we have evidence which points that direction. That would be a justification for continuing. But if in three months' time there's still nothing, then perhaps you have to go back and say, well, perhaps your initial source is, is actually not very good and therefore it shouldn't happen. Well, I think we have to stop, otherwise we're in trouble. Okay, we're being surveyed. <laughs>
Mie kolēģi, es domāju, ka es domāju, ka mēs varam iet finiša taisnē šīs dienas prāta vētrai. Man prāt izvērtās arī galba beigās tāda prāta vētra iesaistoties maksimāli visiem dalībniekiem. Pēc programmas tagad mums ir trīs darba grupu moderātoru nelielis ziņojumi kopsavilkums par Domu lidojumiem katrā darba grupā. Un kā pirmajam es dūšu vārdu tātad darba grupas moderātoram Magbraida kungam par to, cik tad nu tālu jūs to policiju izkontrolēju. Džermani, kāds ir to? I'm not sure that asking the moderator to report back is very objective, but still, it might not comply with convention standards. Um, I think we had a very lively discussion, really, and it was focused upon one issue, really, which was about the operation of surveillance. My, my impression is that this is an area which is going to keep the court busy um, in Strasbourg for some time. There are a number of issues which are, li are likely to arise. It, we weren't, don't, I don't think there was any sense in which people were saying surveillance shouldn't take place, but the problem related to aspects of the practice, uh, but also perhaps the, the legal framework in, in, in certain ways. Um, in particular, I think there was understandable concern about the, the length which surveillance might last for um, as an issue. Um, again, in discussion, we were aware that perhaps there could be cases, but the problem is perhaps is there sufficient control over its continuation and how rigorous that is. Um, and so there were need, I think there are clearly needs to, to reflect upon that and, and adapt procedures. Um, there were also questions about the role of the judges who are responsible. Um, and there were different views expressed about those two judges, I, I believe, um, as to whether or not they were good, doing a good or bad job. Um, but my impression, so I'm abusing my situation, is that perhaps just having two judges or two judges for a long period is wrong. Um, because you need a fresh insight, because if, you, if you've approved something, then you're likely perhaps to reapprove it if, if you are asked to do it and so on and so forth. Um, and certainly the length of time which I mean, one person was invoking a period of up to 15 years, which um, is a very long time to be listening to someone's phone conversation. Um, it's a bit reminding me of that film, The Lives of Others, which um, can also do, drive you crazy if you're listening to other people's conversations, but that's another question. But I think the other important point is about the problem of the evidence which is gathered um, and whether or not this can be shared uh, with the defense, because one of the things which may come out when you're surveying someone is, yes, there might be some sign of criminal activity, but there could be also material which is helpful for the defense. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily all point in one way. And the difficulty is how you deal with that uh, if you don't want to reveal the fact of surveillance um, or you don't want to reveal all the information because how can you assure a fair trial if you're using certain material um, which the other side is not able to see whether or not there might be something in that material which could actually explain away because it's very easy to take uh, conversations out of context which might lead to conclusions of guilt when if you actually saw the larger picture it may be a, a different story. Right. Um, I mentioned in connection with that, some of the experience the UK has had of using um, special advocates in the procedure which is closed to the parties. But I also mentioned that although that was initially done at the prompting from the court in Strasbourg, the Supreme Court in the UK has now reached the conclusion 
that there will be cases where it's actually not consistent with the right to a fair trial because if the material, the allegations are such that you don't disclose some of the key material, then the person cannot provide a proper defence because even with the intervention of special advocates who have security clearance. This is, of course, we have to recognise this is an incredibly difficult area. We need, in certain areas, surveillance to take place because we know there are people who are doing wicked things. But at the same time, as has been said in other contexts, there isn't much point in protecting ourselves if we end up like the people we're trying to protect ourselves from. So this is a very delicate thing, and I, th I think there is still material to be worked through. Um, this comes, I think, also to obviously the, the need, the importance of the case law, because the case law has to continue to develop to try and work out and test some of these principles, because it's all well and good us to talk in, in, in the abstract, as you rightly said about some of the early cases. Um, but you've got to see what the implications of some rulings will be in practice, and so that there is a need for more guidance from the court. So more work for you, Editor. Thank you.